morning and welcome at the Diplomatic Academy. It's a pleasure to uh, have with us uh, the President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Mr. Dennis Francis. A warm welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, it's the first time that we have a President of the General Assembly <laughs> here at this place, as far as I remember. But, uh, so this is a very good occasion to discuss with you and ask you uh, uh, to uh, give us a talk on how you see the most imminent danger that we have on global governance, that is the, <coughs> the crisis of, of multilateralism. Uh, and I'm very pleased that you uh, propose to talk about strengthening multilateralism this morning uh, and international solidarity. Uh, but let me introduce Dennis Francis a little bit to uh, those of you who, who are not familiar. He is one of the most, ex he may be the most experienced uh, diplomat of Trinidad and Tobago, has been with the ministry more than 40 years, uh, and uh, uh, he's been working in many parts of the world uh, for, the con for his country, uh, from Canada to actually Geneva and Vienna. As a non-resident ambassador, also yes. here in the early 2000s uh, here in, in Vienna, so he is familiar with this place that yes. we went with Austria, uh, and uh, uh, you were elected uh, last year to become president for this session, and you started in September uh, yes. uh, your position as, uh, as, as okay. you started. Much better, thank you very much. Uh, you started uh, in September this uh, this uh, uh, position as as president, uh, and uh, um, if if I if I uh, uh, just may as, as, as some sh short introduction, because you don't have too much time here. It's one hour that we have for the discussion. Just let me say it's it's uh, not only the issue of of how can we really turn a solidarity into something effective and and. And, and real practical, but also the issue of, of uh, what is the construction of the United Nations today? How effective is the construction? What chances do we have in changing it? We are all talking about the reform, as you know, of the Security Council, very important, but how are we going about it? Uh, what will happen at the, at the summit of the future uh, next year? And behind all that, uh, what are we talking when we talk about universal values? Uh, those values which are the basis of the Charter from 1945, which are challenged by parts of the Global South, but not only Global South, but also some authoritarian regimes in the East are challenging them. Uh, so there is so much on the plate. Mr. President, uh, may I ask you uh, uh, to share with us your thoughts on, on what's possible in the multilateral arena. Welcome again. Dr. Emil Briggs, Director of the Vienna School of International Studies, members of the faculty, distinguished representatives of the diplomatic community in Vienna, students, ladies and gentlemen. I'm truly honored to be here today at the oldest diplomatic academy in the world, an institution whose remarkable history stretches three centuries and countless borders and cultures. I extend my sincere gratitude to all of you gathered here this morning, as well as to those joining us remotely. This academy's remarkable work has undoubtedly contributed to our collective efforts by offering practical and innovative tools to tackle humanity's greatest challenges. And this is indeed crucial for the work of the United Nations. My purpose in being here is not to deliver a theoretical lecture, but rather to foster a collaborative dialogue aimed at writing tangible action, at reigniting tangible action by institutions such as this in alignment with the United Nations global goals and aspirations. I firmly believe that enhanced collaboration between the United Nations and all stakeholders, including academia, is needed now more than ever, as our world has never been more complex 
no indeed more dangerous. Intensified geopolitical tensions and widening divisions make diplomatic compromises seem impossible. And yet, we must persevere and deepen our efforts to unite the nations. As the saying goes, united we stand, divided we fall. We fail and fall only when we give up, stop trying, and choose inertia. We fail and we fall when we choose narrow self-interest over and above our collective interests. We fail and we fall when we place unilateralism above multilateralism. Importantly, we undermine international cooperation when we abandon diplomacy and dialogue. And we ru ruin the rules-based order when we renege on our vows to adhere to and to promote the principles and purposes enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. That is why, with strong devotion to our shared commitment to the multilateral system, I have chosen peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability for all as the four watchwords of my presidency of the 78th session of the General Assembly. It is why I have committed to reigniting solidarity and unity among the nations and to ensure that we remain focused on implementing our development blueprint, the 2030 Agenda and its 17 goals. Without these basic conditions, the world cannot flourish. Success will, be perpetually elude, will perpetually elude us unless we can relearn the time-tested art of dialogue, diplomacy, and building understanding and trust. This is all too well known here in Vienna, a city that is no stranger to international diplomacy, a multilateral hub that hosts the UN and over 40 international organizations, as well as thousands of diplomats and international officials. Our success as an international community hinges on our ability to foster inclusive collaboration and empower all actors, be it academia, the private sector, youth, civil society, and others to contribute meaningfully to global governance. And I, as President of the General Assembly and the UN membership, call upon you to make your insightful contributions. Without a meaningful multi-stakeholder approach, it is inconceivable that even governments working in collaboration with each other can find effective solutions to the myriad of challenges confronting us at this time. As we gather here today against the backdrop of the greatest number of active conflicts since the founding of the United Nations, our international society feels like a keg of gunpowder on the verge of exploding. Russia's aggression against Ukraine has forcibly displaced millions here in Europe and beyond with political, economic, and social dynamics that forever shape the geopolit geopolitical realities in the future. In the Middle East, decades-long unresolved Palestinian question has horrif horrif horrifically metastasized. The atrocities committed by Hamas against Israel on the 7th of October are grossly reprehensible, and I once again condemn them unabashedly. But the indiscriminate campaign by Israel on the Gaza Strip is certainly not the solution. It is disproportionate and inhumane and offends our sensibilities. It is decidedly not, I repeat, not a solution to the crisis. In fact, it compounds it as it engenders the radicalization of Palestinians, especially the young, who are potentially the future peacemakers. The consequences of both the 7th of October and the 160 days since are therefore 
planting deeper seeds of resentment that will haunt us for decades, making the prospect of peace only more remote. But with the United Nations Security Council incapacitated to effectively discharge its primary responsibility on the maintenance of international peace and security, the General Assembly has consistently filled the void within the limits of its statutory capabilities. On Ukraine, the Assembly has passed six resolutions since March 2022. On Gaza, the Assembly has met on several occasions and has vocalized the will of the global community by adopting two strong resolutions. The General Assembly and I have repeatedly called for an immediate ceasefire to allow for the provision of vital humanitarian assistance to civilians and the unconditional and immediate release of the remaining hostages who are also trapped in the chaos in the Gaza Strip. For both Ukraine and Gaza, as President of the General Assembly, I will continue to assert the demands of the Assembly until we see an end to the senseless suffering. Ladies and gentlemen, with all eyes on Ukraine and the Middle East, we cannot ignore other conflicts that require urgent attention. In Haiti, displacement and gang violence have brought the country to its knees and on the brink of an all-out civil war with lawlessness forming a veil of accountability for the atrocious rape of women and girls. And in the Sudan, a violent struggle for power has led to harrowing atrocities and human rights violations being committed amidst the massive displacement of over 10 million in the last year alone. Yet these and other tragic situations from the de denial of the rights of women and girls in Afghanistan to the cascade of military coups in Africa seem to be forgotten as humanitarian aid is overstretched and political solutions seem out of reach. I can only ask, as I'm sure you would, also, you would also, how can we make progress on sustainable development when the number of people killed in state-based wars essentially doubled between 2022 and 2023. Unless we decisively tackle the drivers of conflict, poverty, injustice, inequality, human rights violations, economic dependence, discrimination, and vulnerability, we will continue to fan the flames of social unrest and upheaval. Dear friends, the prevailing geopolitical climate is also as pronounced as the folly and short-sightedness of our climate ambitions. We cannot say that we were not forewarned through scientific evidence over the past decade about the looming climate catastrophe. Yet we have waited until very late, only to play catch up. Now, the sad reality and the fact is that 2023 was the hottest year on record by far. Climate change is leading to global boiling. Our seas have never been warmer. Our land has never been hotter. According to UN estimates, almost 3 billion people, more than one third of the global population, could be displaced by the effects of global warming by the end of the century. The movement of people at this unprecedented scale would trigger further instability and turmoil. Simultaneously, climate-induced sea level rise is posing an increasingly existential threat to low-lying and small island developing states. And the United Nation, at the United Nations, we are mindful that we have an obligation to address the disproportionate impact of climate change comprehensively and urgently, and to help countries chart a path towards action-oriented and equitable solutions. 
it is challenging that we are taking to, it is a challenge that we are taking to heart. And I am encouraged that at my recommendation, the General Assembly adopted a decision in January to convene a high level meeting in September 2024 to address the threats posed by sea level rise. I remain steadfast in my optimism for I firmly believe that even in the face of adversity, there is always hope. It is imperative that we stand together in unity and solidarity, unwavering in our commitment to the principles and purposes enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. <coughs> the offer by Kenya to support Haiti half a world away when conditions allow is a sign that solidarity exists between and among nations. We need more of that everywhere. And there are upcoming events in our calendar for the world to unite and build on this solidarity. In September, the United Nations will convene the Summit of the Future, a unique opportunity to supercharge SDG implementation it is also the chance for an honest relook at the state of the world today and to try to fix it. To forge a path for a structured dialogue on peace and security in order to avert environmental mayhem or nuclear catastrophe. And I pause here uh, to note that this morning on the news, the president of Russia is threatening the use of nuclear weapons. So there is no hyperbole in what I'm saying. We are in a, an extremely dangerous place. The General Assembly, of which I am privileged to be president, is ready to lead in all these processes. As you may be aware, the member states have started intergovernmental negotiations on the Pact of the Future, as well as on the Declaration on Future Generations, as well as the Global Digital Compact. Let me pause here and emphasize that the Digital Compact is a landmark initiative aiming to bring together governments, the private sector, civil society organizations, the youth and others to work collaboratively on a set of shared principles and commitments for shaping an open and free world, including a secure digital future for all. With technology as an inherent component of achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the massive global digital divide must be redressed if we hope to fulfill its central promise of leaving no one behind. As President of the General Assembly, I will continue to underscore that the outcomes of the summit must be ambitious, action-oriented, and impactful enough to meet the challenges of our time. Furthermore, preparations are underway to convene the General Assembly's first ever Sustainability Week at UN headquarters from the 15th to the 19th of April. This week of high-level events will address sustainability in infrastructure, tourism, energy, transport, as well as a special focus on debt sustainability. The Sustainability Week is intended to galvanize momentum on critical sectors that cut across the entirety of the 2030 Agenda and serve as a building block to the summit of the future. In the run-up to Sustainability Week and beyond, I would welcome your input and suggestions or questions, which can be freely submitted on the Ask PGA platform on my official website. I also encourage you to showcase commitment to sustainability by engaging in our social media campaign by using hashtag ChooseSustainability to be launched on the 1st of April 2024. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot close without re-emphasizing that the world is indeed replete with challenges, but it is also full of opportunities. Opportunities we must effectively harness and leverage to counteract the myriad of challenges confronting us. I urge you all, as members of academia and as responsible global citizens and the guardians of our profession, to play a part in helping the international community to always make the right choices. As the UN member states, whether the stormy seas of their differences and work to reignite solidarity and unity among them, the healing of wounds and the bridging of the divides will, be immense, will also immensely benefit from your active involvement. We all stand to gain from a truly functional rules-based order and a United Nation-led multilateral system that embraces diplomacy and dialogue as the pathway to effective international cooperation, and a multilateral system that is anchored on the tenets of international law, including the principles and purposes enshrined in the Charter. Time is now to come together as one international community, united in acknowledgement of our shared humanity, our embrace of diplomacy, and of the Pacific resolution of disputes, and our noble aspirations for a better future for people and planet in harmonious coexistence. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you for giving us an overview of, of how you see the, actually the dramatic character of the situation uh, we are in. Uh, the question is, do the big ones see already that it is that dramatic, that they will change course? I'm talking about the Security Council reform, first of all. Uh, is there enough dramatic input in the in the system that can make change possible? It, before I open the floor, my question would be: What are the chances uh, for uh, a reform of the uh, UN system, and especially the Security Council? Uh, May I give it? Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, the reality is, and we know this uh, uh, from our own experience, uh, that those who enjoy power and privilege are never really in a hurry to share that power and privilege. But having said that, uh, I should also say quickly that uh, the context in which we are living now, the atmospherics are such that there is uh, an enhanced uh, um, uh, demand, uh, requirement for there to be substantive reform uh, of this United Nations Security Council as part of a larger reform process. Uh, of the UN, including the General Assembly. Now, uh, UN, the whole business of UN reform and reform of the Council is not new. This has been going on for a long time um, in subtle ways. For example, before 9-11, before, uh, there was no unit in the UN dealing with the question of international terrorism. In the wake of 9-11, such a unit was established and in fact is very active and functional in, uh, uh, in, in, in saving us uh, from uh, um, um, in the incidents of terrorism. We don't know this necessarily because so many attempts at terrorism have been quelled that 
public attention is not drawn. It's only when there is an event that people realize, you know, how pernicious this danger is. But that unit exists and works very well. Um, so this process of reform has been ongoing. The issue at hand is that the structure of the Security Council in 2024 does not represent the, uh, the geopolitical realities, realities of today. It was established at a different era in history. Circumstances were quite different. Uh, the world was not comprised of 193 countries as it, as, it does now, as it is now. And most of the countries in the global south, in fact, did not exist. In addition to which, you have countries, uh, developing countries, um, exercising extraordinary influence regional, regionally and globally. The Indias and Chinas of this world, the Brazil, South Africa, uh, countries like perhaps at a lower, at a lower level, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Mexico, uh, Argentina. So our world is changing. The dynamics have changed radically. Yet the structures uh, remain archaic. Uh, and so decision making is frustrated by this. Um, the, you asked a very specific question, whether the big ones uh, uh, are willing to accept. Well, um, for the very first time that I can recall, a United States president actually verbalized US readiness to, uh, uh, to look at the question of Security Council reform. And I think what has driven this to a significant degree, it's a number of things, uh, not the least of which is Russian aggression in Ukraine. That's one, but there are other considerations. Uh, the fact that, for example, <clears throat> uh, the fact that um, you have countries, large countries, uh, who are rivaling the traditional uh, centers of power, and whose pervasive global influence is a reality. Um, so there has to be some accommodation in the system. Uh, you, have, you have a country like India, uh, which has a massive campaign to become a member, a permanent member of the Security Council. And then, of course, you have, uh, you cannot escape the fact that the African continent, which is very large and very populous, has no representation, no permanent represent representation on the council. Um, now, I always make this remark when I discuss security council reform. It's a process. It's not an event. I say that to say, that um, it would not be realistic to expect that you would awaken one morning next week, or perhaps next month, or in December, and discover that there is a reformed Security Council. In fact, while the discussions, note the language, while the discussions around reform are in high gear, the negotiations have not yet begun in earnest. The timing of the, the commencement of negotiations will be a matter for the members themselves in the General Assembly to determine. There are some that want uh, negotiations to begin immediately. Not all share that view. Not all share that view. So uh, I would say to you that reform is definitely on the agenda. It's not going to go off because there's frustration in the House among all delegations that the Security Council uh, seems incapacitated to act 
even in the most egregious situations regarding uh, human rights and human dignity. And this, of course, is an offense to our sensibilities. But all is not lost because there has been resort to the General Assembly, which has residual powers in matters of peace and security. There is one proviso in the Charter, and that proviso is that the General Assembly may not take up an issue of peace and security while it is being discussed in the Security Council. So you would notice that it is only after the Security Council had failed to reach a decision on Gaza that it was taken up in the General Assembly. And having taken it up there, the Assembly issued some very strong, very clear demands um, uh, which stand today, and the Assembly has reaffirmed those. It took, it took the General Assembly uh, to reach a, a decision and issue a resolution on Gaza to put some political pressure on the Council, which subsequently then agreed uh, a resolution on Gaza during the presidency of, the, of China in November last year. Before that, nothing. And, and then it was strictly dealing with the humanitarian situation on the ground, the need to get access to be able to provide relief uh, to the people of Gaza. So reform, yes, it's on the agenda. It's not going to go off. There is, I think, universal uh, interest and commitment that it should happen. They are actually now the co-facilitators in that process who incidentally, it might please you to know, one of whom is Austrian, the permanent representative of Austria, and his counterpart is the permanent representative of, of Kuwait. Uh, they're doing an extraordinary job at the moment discussing the different models that have been placed on the table for Security Council reform. You might think, as some might be inclined to, that this is uh, maybe theatrics. It is not. Because even though the formal negotiations have not begun, the process of discussing the formulas helps delegations to understand the subtle distinctions between those formulas and what to make an assessment of what might work best in the complex uh, uh, environment in which the Security Council has to operate and in which we require it to be effective. No, Mr. Ambassador, a frustration is never a good friend. <laughs> uh, you said we are in a process. Yes. We are not there to have formal negotiations. But as we all know, and we had one year ago at this place uh, a discussion about the reform of the UN system, yes. also with our colleagues from New York. Uh, and then it was said, uh, actually, we started the process at least 16 years ago, 15, mm -hmm. 16 years ago. Where are we? Is it a marathon? Uh, <laughs> how optimistic are you? Uh, how can we help to create even more pressure uh, as we realize that in all these issues you mentioned, from Ukraine to Gaza, Haiti, Sudan, the General Assembly cannot substitute fully the Security Council responsibilities, no. as you know. So where are we? The General Assembly cannot. Uh, uh, because the General Assembly has been, ass the Charter assigns um, only uh, supplemental authority to the General Assembly, residual authority on matters of peace and security. Peace and security uh, virtually lies in the domain of the security. It's the raison d'etre for the existence of the Security Council. But let me say quickly, because uh, there's a body of thought uh, that suggests that the, security, that the General Assembly uh, and the resolutions it passes are useless. 
That is, you cannot get further <coughs> from the truth than that. Now, it is true that resolutions passed by the Security Council have the force of law. Everyone is required, all member states is required uh, to uh, implement those resolutions. Resolutions passed by the General Assembly, however, do not have the force of law. That does not render them useless. Because what the General Assembly resolution represents is the compelling opinion and will of the majority of the 193 member states. It's a political declaration that the General Assembly makes. And that in itself has power. Because as has happened to a significant degree with Russia, those resolutions can have the effect of isolating states. No state in international relations wants to be isolated. Because isolation means that you cannot be effective in exercising influence in the system. And for example, uh, many of you who follow these things closely may know that Russia, for example, had a, a candidature for membership of the Human Rights Council. That candidature failed. It failed. Um, they also have a candidature for membership of the Economic and Social Council. And they have been trying for several, several months uh, it comes up maybe every six weeks or two months, whatever it is. The candidature is stuck. It does not advance. So there is a price to be paid for violating the rules and breaking the system. And that price, to a significant degree, is uh, engendered by resolutions passed by the General Assembly. You cannot ignore public opinion. And so you ask the question about uh, what can be done, how can, how can you, uh, pressure, you be The pressure, helpful? yeah. Um, well, you can do a number of things. Uh, public opinion is increasingly important in an era where everything is driven by media. Uh, you can write, for example, express your views in the newspapers, write to the editor. Uh, you can lobby your government, the government of Austria, uh, about the urgency of the need to address the question frontally of reform of the council. Uh, when, you, uh, when you have international guests uh, visiting the academy, uh, ministers from foreign governments, uh, uh, you can arrange uh, situations like this and have your students pummel the minister because public, you, have a, you have a voice. This is the brand new world of the 21st century. And youth voices are important voices. Uh, the whole summit of the future process is designed to engage the next generation of leaders, thought leaders like yourself, uh, to prepare you for the realities that will confront you uh, when you go get out into society and you occupy positions where you have to make decisions or prov provide advice uh, to leaders uh, on what would be the best decision to make in the circumstance. So you are not without, it, without some ability to contribute to the system and to help to make it better. Uh, because uh, more and more there's an appreciation within the UN that stakeholder engagement must become part of the normative operating uh, procedures of the organization. Let me, let me open up to the questions from the audience. In the last row, please. 
Thank you, Your Excellency. I'm Luca Fetter. I'm a student here at the DA. And uh, maybe staying on that topic, um, I was wondering whether you perceive a functional change in the role of the GA in matters of peace and security, given the recent adoption of the veto initiative by consensus, the proliferation of the use of veto in the Security Council over the past maybe two years, uh, and the stalling IGN process, or whether you would say this is just a continuation of uh, the process that has started with the Uniting for Peace resolution and um, the role that the GA always had in maintenance of peace and security? No, there's been a change. There's no doubt about it. Um, there's almost a sense in which uh, there is increased reliance on the General Assembly uh, to take action. Now, I'm always very careful about how I represent this, because the General Assembly may not, may not accept lawfully uh, invoke those powers. So it is not that. Uh, I'm very, very careful about this. It is not that the General Assembly is seeking to usurp the role and function of the Security Council. You'd know that I said it is only in the context of failure in the Council that the General Assembly will act. Um, and that action has been very decisive. Uh, in fact, um, now these provisions are not new per se. But for a very long time, they'd never been invoked. Well, we're invoking them now as matters of accountability and transparency. In fact, as it happens, the Security Council is required to report to the General Assembly uh, and give account annually for the work that is done in the Council. And uh, um, the mood is such now that for the first time, you know, it had become the, tr excuse me, the tradition that the assembly would write a very sort of sterile report, um, more or less the same report every year, changing a couple of words. The general assembly is no longer accepting that. Uh, in fact, uh, for the first time uh, earlier this year, uh, we convened a meeting with under the British presidency of the Security Council. Uh, and member states had the opportunity to express their concerns on the draft report and to say what additional information they wanted to see included in the report. Now, the British did make clear that uh, their voice is not the only voice that will shape the final outcome of the report. It's going to have to, because this is a, a report for the entire council. But they did take on board, take note of the sentiments expressed in the room. That has never happened before. So there is a shift. There is uh, increased reliance on the General Assembly in, this, in the wake of the situation in the Security Council. Yes, please, in the second row and then in the fourth row. Hello, my name is Milan Gajic. I'm from Serbia. I'm a master student here at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. Thank you for, so much for a very insightful and uh, interesting lecture. And uh, I concluded from your lecture that uh, our future is not that bright that we expect to be. And uh, what we can do to change that? It's a good very, question. A very general question, yes. but an important one. Yes. Yes. Ah. Hope. There's the answer. I deal with these issues every day. I would be less than honest if I did not say to you uh, that there are moments of intense uh, frustration, sometimes sadness. Sometimes helplessness, but I wake up every morning with hope. Uh, hopelessness only becomes a reality when we give up and walk away. We, the people, 
have the power to make a difference. And so my advice to you, young people, global leaders, thought leaders, globalists, is first of all to pay attention to what's going on around you and to, uh, uh, to, to value the principles on which the UN is based. Uh, the principles of cooperation, of building understanding, of following the law. Without the law, we would be living in societies of total anarchy. Without the international law, if we, if we uh, what Russia did, for example, is tantamount to tearing up the Charter of the United Nations and throwing it in the bin. We cannot have that. Because if that were to become the norm, uh, there'd be no order in society. We would go back to the days of the 19th century, where might is always right. And we have seen in our own experience that might is often wrong. It's wrong. Uh, that is why the values and principles are important, because they give us a basis to apply these rules and these values universally. It cannot be that there are one set of rules for those who have large armies and large arsenals and who may have their finger on the nuclear button, and no rules, no rules for them, but rules for the powerless. It cannot be. We must have universally applied standards of behavior that create a framework of rules and predictability and order for international society, just as we do in domestic jurisdictions. Uh, so uh, don't give up hope. Uh, you know, you see, you see promise and you see potential in little and subtle ways uh, sometimes, reading the newspaper. You see magical stories of, of success where you thought that uh, failure was inevitable. And that's one of the things that, uh, that keeps me optimistic. I think as human beings, we have extraordinary potential. We've de demonstrated this time and time again. We have done phenomenal things in the past. And I'm quite sure, I'm confident, that we have the ability to do them again in the future. I am, I am, we are in a period of adjustment. And it's strange because it's unfamiliar. Uh, the world is going through a period. We've had a bipolar world that has disappeared. We are now in a period of a multipolar world there's an adjustment that has to take place, but we must hold fast to our fundamental values and principles because those are the anchors. Those are the stabilizers that will eventually shape where we end up. Uh, so don't be, uh, uh, look up, not down. It's what I do. My name is uh, Gregory Weeks. I'm an expert in political violence. Yes. Um, but I want to say thank you for your positivity. Um, I always get questions from students. Yes. Uh, and they say, um, you know, the UN can't manage and whatever. And I say, well, it's the best that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but something I think is equally important, and this is important for the students in the room, is the question of how we train students uh, to do work at the international level as international civil servants. Yes. Uh, we seem to do a very poor job of that. Mm -hmm. And then there are the short-term contracts at the UN. And the question is, is the General Assembly doing anything to address uh, training of the younger generation and of the short-term contracts at the UN? It's a very interesting question that you raise. And I can't say uh, my response to that is uh, it's twofold. The General Assembly 
For example, you won't find that issue as an item on the General Assembly. It's not a matter of debate. But the President of the General Assembly, and I claim no paternity over this, uh, it was initiated uh, by my predecessor uh, two sessions ago, I believe, uh, in the 76th session. We have among our team six uh, um, young people uh, selected independently through an independent process. I played no role in it. And they're they are called fellows. They have been sponsored to work alongside members of my team in the office of the president to expose them to the full gamut of work done by the office of the president of the General Assembly. So it's sort of like on-the-job training. They get to work on projects uh, for a period of time, and then they are also attached <coughs> to the mission um, to their country mission in New York. So they see the equation from both sides, both from the institutional point of view, but also from the point of view, the political perspective of their mission. And that has, has, has worked extraordinarily well. Um, but it's a point uh, that, uh, it's an interesting point you raise. Uh, I haven't heard it uh, uh, reflected anywhere in the General Assembly before. Uh, so that's something that I'll take back. Because we do need to train and to encourage. I do this everywhere I go, um, to train people. Listen, we can't, we, we all love our countries. Nobody is asking you not to do that. And countries have interests. That's natural, OK? But. Despite that, we have to find a way to get along and to make common cause in addressing those issues that require universal engagement and support. How, how can we ever address climate change if we do not all make a contribution? How can we? You recall what happened some years ago when a former government of the United States decided to withdraw from the climate agreement. Hmm? There are pandemics. It's a no-brainer. There has to be international cooperation. It is the stuff that saves us time and time again. And we know from based on scientific evidence that climate change is only going to get worse, and the frequency and the virulence of, of, of pandemics is likely to get worse. So we are not asking anyone or proposing that, you know, that we love each other, everybody loves each other. No, that's a choice you would make individually. What we're asking is simply that you, we collaborate we understand that this is a question of survival, uh, that we need to make common cause in how we interact with, uh, with our planet. Because if we are to subsist on this planet intergenerationally, then we need to change and adapt our ways to ensure that we do not violate environmental limits that would have the effect of shortening our own existence on this planet. So it's really being smart in our interests uh, to do the things that our own existence requires, that our longevity requires. Uh, because uh, without, it, without taking those actions conjunctively, collaboratively, uh, and uh, um, with some degree of urgency, uh, the future will not be bright at all, and uh, there'd be little room for hope. So this is really about being pragmatic more than anything else. It's pragmatism, doing what our own existence requires us to do. 
And Mr. Mr. I know you have to leave. <laughs> One more question, is that One possible? Yes, yes please. Yeah, Your Excellency, Your Excellency yes. I have a question. How does the UN stand to the statement, the peace suggestion from the Pope, Pope Francis? The peace suggestion. I don't know that there's a UN position, really. Uh, but but let me say this. But your position, possibly. But let me say this. You know, anything, anything, except those that might qualify as being unethical, that supports and promotes peace, the UN will support. Because peace is the UN brand. It's our purpose. And let me leave you with one thought. It's not an original thought, because I'm not a plagiarist, but it's a very powerful thought. And I would invite you, anytime you're in New York, uh, go to the office get a pass and visit the UN and go into the UN gardens, you will see a statue there of Mahatma Gandhi. And the inscription on that statue is very simple. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. Remember that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for, uh, for this optimistic ending. Uh, it's good to see that we have people there sitting who, are, who uh, do believe in the system and who want to make a change. We Austrians uh, have a saying, unfortunately, which is a bit more cynical. We say the situation is hopeless, but not serious. <laughs> <laughs> we wish you all the best for the for you, UN uh, Commission on Narcotic Drugs now in Vienna, and enjoy yeah. your stay in Vienna. Thank you for coming. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much.